Hi. All right. Excellent. New speaker. Hello. Hello. All right. Do you want me to introduce you? Do you want to introduce Go yourself? Go for it, and I'll pick up from Tabitha? there. All right. Uh, this is Tabitha Sable. Uh, she's been a hacker and cross-platform sysadmin since the turn of the century. Her first exposure to Rogue was under OpenBSD Max 68K 2.3 on the trusty Quadra 800, which are just words to me, uh, which soon led to commissioning a 386 server and offering shell and game services to her fellow students, which is very impressive. Today, she can usually be found teaching adversarial techniques to other engineers, sharing systems engineering viewpoints with security folks, bicycling, and saying, I wonder what happens if we... <laughs> and yeah, you're here to talk to us about curses, which is very exciting. Very yeah, exciting. yeah, that's absolutely the case. So uh, yeah. yeah, like... Uh, Take it away. Thank you. Yeah, like, hey, good good morning. Um, you know, like she said, I'm, I'm Tabitha Sable, and uh, I got exposed to rogue, rogue and roguelike in around the same way that I got exposed to a lot of these other things to to information security concepts and to like being a sysadmin and, and running servers for people um, all sort of at the same time um, because it was it was just a really good situation at school and so I was I was playing with rogue around the same time that I was learning a lot of these professional things and so to me like thinking about rogue ends up being tied into this whole story of the evolution of unix and the evolution of the software that was needed to support being able to use unix and the applications that you run on it um, like games so that's that's what I'm here to share with you this morning it, one of my favorite things a story of why things are how they are or how the path that we took influenced where we ended up. And so along the way, we end up hitting some fun questions like, why did Bell Labs give us the ed editor while Berkeley gave us VI? Um, why doesn't adventure, like the Colossal Cave adventure, repeat the room description this on subsequent times that you enter the room? Um, if you are used to using a graphical interface on a Linux or BSD or, or commercial Unix machine, um, you've, you've used X windows. Why is it called X Windows? And you know, where did Rogue get its great graphics from? You know, all of these kinds of questions are tied up in that story of what the hardware and software that we interface with Unix looked like. So in that story, there are three major area eras. There's the earliest time of paper teletypes, research Unix from Bell Labs, and then moves into a middle period of glass teletypes or video display terminals, or the, the term of art at the time was dumb terminals, and BSD Unix. And then after we pass through that time, we move into workstations with bitmap displays, uh, the so-called Unix wars with a lot of different commercial vendors selling Unix-based operating systems, and the starting of modern open source. So we'll begin at the beginning with paper teletypes and research Unix, you know, from the late 60s into the mid 70s. Um, but the story actually starts way, way, way before then, like in the early and then moving into late 1800s. So, you know, in the, uh, in the 1800s, the uh, telegraph was invented. And of course, to use a telegraph, you had to learn Morse code. That requires a lot of skill. And so, you know, it was, a, it was a limiting factor for, you know, how many telegraph lines you could run. You had to have skilled telegraph operators. So there was a desire to reduce that amount of skill that you needed. And that desire led to the creation of a lot of, um, of teleprinters. And you see an example of a very, very early one here with this piano-like keyboard and, um, not, not super practical, but slightly easier to use than learning Morse code. Um, by the turn of the century, these had evolved into much more practical machines, like this Morecambe printing telegraph that you see here from 1908, um, where it's essentially a electric typewriter connected to a telegraph line or a serial link or some other thing like that with another one on the other side. So you type on the keyboard here and it encodes the data, shoots it down the wire and makes the printer move on the other side and vice versa. And so this was much easier to learn, much easier to find people to do and let news move across the country in the United States and around the world in a much 
faster and easier way. So the uh, Bordeaux code, like a five-bit binary code, got uh, settled on pretty early as the standard that these uh, teletypes would communicate with each other over. And incidentally, that's why your serial port speed, your modem speed, get called baud rate today. So we're done with the turn of the century. We're going to flash forward into the early to mid 60s. And the computing industry is in the beginning of this shift from batch oriented machines that use card punches for input into shared multi user interactive systems. So MIT, General Electric, and Bell Labs were working together on a project called Multix, which envisioned the computer as a utility, you know, like premonitions of the cloud here, right? So there'd be a big computer in a central office somewhere, and if you had programs you needed to run, you could run them on this big computer that you could subscribe to, and, uh, you know, then everything would be great. So this system had to be very robust because it had to be everything to everybody. So the Multix, the Multix operating system was originally designed to run on a huge mainframe system from uh, GE, the uh, 645. It had about two and a quarter megabytes of RAM, which was a tremendous amount of RAM in the mid 1960s. Um, the teletype was kind of an obvious choice for interfacing with one of these interactive time sharing computers. And Bell, um, the Bell system owned the Teletype Corporation since 1930. So the folks at Bell Labs who were working on Multics had Teletype TTY37 terminals, which were really fancy Teletypes. They had upper and lower case. So now 1969, it's the beginning of Unix. We see here is a later picture of... Uh, PDP-11, like what uh, Unix kind of blossomed onto in the early 70s at AT&T and Bell Labs. So in 1969, Bell pulled out of the Multics project and management wouldn't let any engineers buy a large computer because they were afraid that the people who had been working on Multics were disappointed. And if they had a big computer, they would just start building something like Multics again. And uh, some, of these, some of these folks here, we see uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie. Um, you know, they, they wanted a nice system to use like they had gotten used to, but they couldn't buy a computer. They tried a few times and kept getting, uh, kept getting denied. But they found in Department 13, local area switching, a disused PDP-7. This was a tiny, tiny, tiny computer. It had nine kilobytes of RAM. Compare that to the two and a quarter megabytes that the uh, GE machine from Multics had. Um, but it was there and it was a computer and it was free at a time when even a tiny computer was wicked expensive. So they took it and they wrote a tiny little time sharing operating system for it. Eventually they proved that it was practical and uh, they bought a bigger tiny computer. They got a PDP-11 with 24 kilobytes of core memory. And that one was big enough that, that Unix could be really useful in self-hosting on it. And of course they kept their TTY-37s that they had from Multics. At this time, login to a Unix system was by a local serial connection or dial-up modem only. And the uh, device nodes, because in Unix, everything is a file, the device nodes were named slash dev slash TTY and a number because it was which number teletype it was. And so like if you have worked with any uh, any Linux commands that deal with sending serial data through devices, you may have occasionally received the error message, not a typewriter. And this is why, because the, uh, the TTY device that, uh, that you were running your data through had a uh, control issue to it that only made sense if it was really a TTY. And these names still show up on the names of serial ports on a modern Linux system today. Terminal handling was complicated from the beginning. I just absolutely love this quote, IOCTL is a closet full of skeletons. So IOCTL was originally designed in Unix as a system call for configuring the IO properties, the input output properties of a teletype. Um, so in the very first Unix manual from 1971, there's a place where it says, Unix has a heavy predisposition towards model 37 teletype terminals. And the init program, which managed logins on all the terminals, did magic automatic detection between a TTY37 and a GE Terminet 300, which was a different terminal. It was a little more inexpensive. Um, next year, they added support for another terminal. 
and the STTY command appeared in the manual. And that was to tune the settings of your TTY. And even in 1972, the manual said, this call should be used with care. It is all too easy to turn off your typewriter. Um, by the sixth edition Unix in 1975, STTY started to really acknowledge that this was a huge complexity problem by including packages so that instead of specifying all of the different settings like the baud rate and the number of bits per word and so on, if you had a popular terminal, you could just apply the package. And so even in these early days with, with teletypes, there was a lot of complexity in this software. So now we've made it into sort of the middle period of video display terminals and BSD Unix. Video display terminals were unimpressive at first, but they improved really rapidly. Um, this is a picture of a data point 3300. It was the very first video display terminal. Um, they came out in 1969. They were wicked expensive. Um, they didn't actually support as many fancy features as the high-end teletypes, but it was quiet, it was self-contained, it didn't take up a lot of space, and uh, you know, paved the way for what was going to come forward. So by the time we get to the late 70s, here is a, uh, a digital equipment corporation, VT100, which was sort of the de facto standard terminal. I have, you know, it was like the terminal that, uh, that everybody else wanted to be. Um, you know, by the time we get to the late 70s here, you know, you had a machine that had a lot of features. It could do upper and lower case, blank the whole screen, move the cursor around, a um, lot, of, lot of fancy things. Um, and this particular terminal also is the one that introduced today's standard of 80 by 24 characters. So in almost every terminal emulator today, when you first open it up, the most basic default is 80 by 24. This is why, this VT100. And that evolution continued so that by the early 80s, here is a VT220, which took over for the VT100 as being the most popular terminal in the world. And it was smaller, cheaper, and fancier. So two things were happening in this era. First off, Bell Labs was slow to give up their paper teletypes. Um, they got in the mid 70s some Tektronix 4014 storage tube terminals like you see in this picture but they were very slow to redraw. Um, it's not a bitmap display on here. It's not a character cell display. It's a vector display. And so it's got a storage tube, it's vector drawing. And so you would send it commands like draw a line from this coordinate to that coordinate. It had a character cell mode, but the character cell mode was implemented by logic inside the terminal that would have to use the vector drawing commands internally to draw you know, each one of the little letters. And because it's a um, because it's a storage display tube, you have to erase the whole screen at once. So it's it's not paper, but it's very slow and clunky and not really suited to the kind of interactive use that we would see later. On the other hand, the University of California Berkeley was really quick to adopt um, glass TTYs. So what you see here is an ADM3 dumb terminal, which was especially famous for being the first video display terminal that cost less than $1,000 US. These are what were installed in a lot of the computer labs at the uh, University of California, Berkeley, around the time when the Berkeley software distribution Unix started starting up. If you look really carefully at that picture, you can see there's no arrow keys on the keyboard, but the uh, letters H, J, K, and L have arrows printed on them. And this is why, to this day, those are the letters that you use to move around in VI. So these, these enhanced capabilities, like being able to you know, do colors on some fancy terminals, bold, underline, flashing, clear the screen, move the cursor around, um, and the greater diversity. I only talked about the deck terminals because they were the most popular, but there were many, many manufacturers, and uh, oftentimes they were mutually incompatible with each other. Um, these capabilities and diversity required more complicated software to manage it. And that's where we get into the story of the VI editor, the curses library, and eventually Rogue. So ED is the canonical Unix editor. It's a line-oriented editor. It's designed to be used on a paper teletype. And honestly, I think it's really well designed. It, it is 
the easiest to use editor that I can imagine if your input to the computer is a keyboard and the output is a typewriter. But it's notoriously hard to use. Um, I'll, I'll share with you one of my favorite uh, entries from the Unix fortune cookie program. Ken Thompson has an automobile which he helped design. Unlike most automobiles, it has neither speedometer, nor gas gauge, nor any of the other numerous lights which plague the modern driver. Rather, if the driver makes a mistake, a giant question mark lights up in the center of the dashboard. The experienced driver, says Thompson, will usually know what's wrong. So, in the mid-70s, 1976, um, George Corlutas wrote, M, the editor for mortals, based on Ed, with additional features to make it more user-friendly. Um, he came and was either visiting or a student, I don't recall at the moment, at uh, UC Berkeley, and uh, showed it to Bill Joy and friends, and they picked that up and ran with it. So as they improved it, they started incrementing the name, E-M, E-N, um, you know, the historical record has lost how many different name versions they went to, but eventually they did get EX. So in 1978, the first Berkeley software distribution add-on for Unix shipped with X and the library called TermCap that powered it. So one of the most popular features of X was visual mode. You could type visual into the command line, and then instead of doing this like paper teletype inspired line oriented editing where you had to remember what your file looked like and you could only see the exact bit you were working on, instead, if you had a nice glass TTY, it would take over the whole screen and show you what you were working on as you were working on it, which was you know, very new and revolutionary at the time. So in order to support that, there was some code in there for redrawing the screen. And rather than having the various idiosyncrasies of the supported terminal types hard-coded into the X source code, um, it was put out into a file, like a, like a database file. And this is what it looked like. Um, this was difficult to read and write, but it was a, a major improvement over having everything hard-coded in the source code. And so the term cap library that could parse these descriptions of terminals and use them to know how to do the things that the visual mode needed, in a way that was device independent, this was this was very important and popular. Um, in 2BSD, the uh, X executable got a hard link called VI, and if you called it as VI, then it would start up directly into visual mode. And in 1979, the maintenance of VI was handed over to a new hacker, Marianne Horton, and uh, that'll come in in important later. It, by 1980, the fourth BSD distribution shipped, and it included a library called Curses. So Ken Arnold took the screen redrawing code, basically lifted it right out of VI, and wrapped it up into a nice, uh, a nice library wrapper so that you could write an application that described what you wanted a character cell graphics display to look like, and Curses would take care of implementing the minimum number of cursor movements and redraws and things like that necessary to update the screen to look like what you just asked it to look like. And now you can build really fancy stuff. So Rogue is the canonical curses application. Here's a picture of the, con here's a picture of Rogue. And um, it's not actually the first curses application. Um, in fact, uh, at the first roguelike celebration, Ken was on, was here, and in a panel, he told us that uh, he was writing some some applications for his own use, like to display which of his friends were logged in, things like that, um, and that those were the first curses applications. But Rogue was certainly like the killer app. So. We're getting to the end of this period of, of video display terminals, and we're getting to the time when we get to workstations, microcomputers with bitmap graphics displays, and modern open source. So in the very early 80s, Bell Labs was doing really advanced stuff. Here is a, uh, here's a picture of their Blit 
graphical terminal for Unix, um, didn't have any local disk, it ran a tiny OS from ROM, and it could actually download more executable code over the serial link from the Unix system it was connected to. This is very advanced. Um, but uh, it was stuck within Bell Labs. Um, in summer 1982 at the Usenix convention, uh, Marianne Horton presented a paper called New Curses and Term Info, showing that the uh, curses library had been re-implemented to be more optimized, easier to use, easier to read the code for, and the term cap library, which had some severe performance problems at startup and was hard to read, the database for had been also updated into a more performant um, library with a database that had human readable descriptions that got compiled into bytecode in order to be you know, read in more rapidly at program startup. But those cool things happening in Bell Labs didn't filter out into the rest of the market. So in, in 1984, Bill Joy did an absolutely wonderful interview with, I believe, I don't remember the name of the magazine, pardon me for that, um, but said here, the fundamental tension in Unix that I think AT&T doesn't understand is that everyone is going to have a bitmap. Um, you know, AT&T had a bitmap, but clearly people weren't aware of that. So research Unix continued to evolve, but it didn't really influence the market. What did influence the market was that people were starting to get into microcomputers. I mean, obviously the, the Windows logo here is a little too new for this era, but in uh, 1986, NCSA Telnet came out for the Mac and PC. It had an internal IP stack because nobody had networking stack built into their operating system anymore, but you could use a DOS PC or you could use a Mac to access a Unix system because back in 1983, 4.2 BSD added TCP IP to Unix. And uh, also around that same time period at MIT, a research window system called the W system got improved and so since we increment names in order to indicate that we've improved something, X Windows was born in 1984. In 1987, um, the X Windows system version 11 was released under the MIT license, famous open source license still in use today. And because of the openness of that license, it became immediately popular. So now we get into licensing concerns, microcomputers, and these things lead into the start of the modern open source movement. So in 1982, Pavel Curtis was uh, sort of commissioned by Marianne to clone the new curses library in a clean room way so that outside of Bell Labs, folks could appreciate the improvements to curses. In 1984, work began on the GNU project to make a free Unix clone that didn't have any licensing encumbrances from AT&T, Bell Labs. Um, in 1986, 4.3 BSD came out, which was the last BSD release that had AT&T code and copyrights in it. So commercial Unix kind of rolled on through the 80s there. In 1991, we saw the very first release of the Linux kernel and uh, also 386 BSD, which was a uh, BSD release that had had all of the AT&T code removed, well, a lot of AT&T code removed from it. Um, but P-Curses kind of languished. The last maintenance release of P-Curses was in 1986. But in 1993, it got re-picked up and uh, re-released as N-Curses. And this was the last we ever saw of the original Ken Arnold Curses. 1993 was a big year there for uh, open source because it was the year that we saw Slackware Linux come out and NetBSD. So starting there from the mid 90s, we had a lot of what turned into the modern open source movement. We had gotten away from the AT&T research Unix and moved into a more, you know, a time of paying more attention to whether licensing concerns were going to hurt our ability to publish software. So we're now about 50 years into VI. But I'm guessing that most of you that are here today know how to exit Vim. Your Unix shell still talks to a teletype just like it did on the PDP-7 at Bell Labs in 1969. Um, you know, the, I love this Bill Joy quote here because if 10 years is a long time for VI, 50 years is incredible. But it's because the ideas are advancing, but they're sticky. 
they influence the next generation of software and of applications that we can write. So Visual Studio Code is arguably more advanced than Vim, but it's still influenced by the fact that the ADM threes that were at UC Berkeley didn't have arrow keys. They had arrows printed on the HJKNL keys, and you can still turn on VI key bindings in Visual Studio Code because the software that we're used to using influences what we want in the next generation of software. And so even when we advance ideas, they stick around. So thank you very much. I'm, I'm always happy to share things like this. So uh, I think we have a little bit of time for questions. We do. Thank you so much. That was an amazing history lesson. And it's, it's very fun to watch in chat how many people have fond and less than fond memories of much of the technology that you're talking about. <laughs> Absolutely, me too. Um, so do, do we have a couple of questions? We do. We have one that's just a comment of how cool the rainbow terminal is. Uh, it's called lolcat and uh, it's, it's funny, I installed it last night and it took 31 megabytes to do the install on my Ubuntu machine. It's a big Ruby thing, it pulls in a lot of libraries and whatever. So out of curiosity, I went and looked at how big the install sets for OpenBSD that, that like got me started on Unix on me on the old Mac that I had 20 years ago were, and they were about 20-ish megabytes. So this entire Unix system was smaller than the modern library, the, you know, the modern program that I used to make the pretty, uh, the pretty pictures. But it's called Lolcat, and I highly recommend it. All right, good to know. I think some people in the, the chat correctly called that out. Um, oh, okay. One great question from Esther. I'd like to hear more about Unix and Unicode and why roguelikes are so strongly associated with the ASCII block when Unicode is quite old. <laughs> that's a, that's a really great question that I am not a like a real deep expert on this but for a long time um you know for a long time unix was was very highly dependent on on ascii in particular um with with ascii being hard coded and just assumed all throughout and so through the uh through the 80s and 90s any sort of non-ASCII text representation was a real struggle. Um, so, you know, obviously text representations were a real struggle at that time too. Um, you know, you've got three or four different uh, competing standards for encoding Japanese, you know, all of, all of these things. Um, and so during that time, the, the code was all very, was all very ad hoc. And so like, if you wanted to be able to type in, um, you know, Chinese, Japanese, or Korean on like an X11 system, you really had to be a real expert to get this stuff to work at all. And, you know, I think that part of that is just that these things were developed in the United States by this like group of people who were for the most part, all very similar to each other and, you know, all speaking English to each other. And so when, uh, when Unicode started getting developed, it was it was really slow to get uptake. Um, in part because the software ecosystem that Unicode was trying to get into was such a mess. Um, and you know, my only slightly informed opinion on this, like as somebody who was learning Japanese around the turn of the century and like struggling with how to type it on computers in those days, um, is that there's a bit of everybody had either given up on it or fought so hard to get the existing bad implementations to work um, that that there was a lot of sunk cost involved there. And so I like my personal slightly informed opinion is that Unicode take up was really delayed by the fact that everybody had either given up or had so much invested in what was already there that nobody wanted to switch. But the advantages are obvious. And so, you know, given 20 extra years, now we have pretty decent Unicode support, yeah. you know, everywhere, like in, you know, in, in the terminals on my Ubuntu box that I'm talking to right now. But it took a long time. And I think it's mostly just because of trying to get rid of all the old bad software. Yeah, no, that makes a, a lot of sense. Um, one probably last quick question. Uh, do you have a favorite old terminal? Do I have a favorite old terminal? You know, 
I yeah, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say yeah. I am I am actually a big fan of the VT220, um, in part because of a mistake that I made that got me into being a sysadmin. So we had in, in school we had this this computing club, and you know we had a bunch of old like cast off Unix workstations and junk like that. Um, this was in like the late 90s, like 99, and so we had some Unix machines that were 10 years old at that time, um, and. Um, we had a Sun 3 server with, uh, it had a serial console. And so it had a VT220 sitting on top of this rack mount server, sitting on a desk in a computer lab. And of course the, the VT220 had horrible screen burn in because it was always sitting there at a login prompt. <laughs> and, uh, and I saw it and I felt bad for it, right? So I went up and I pushed the power button on the front of the VT220 and, uh, and somebody ran over because I was like, this is just a serial connection. It's not gonna care. Um, and somebody ran over, don't do that. Well, why not? Uh, because it, it had like a 25 pin serial connection. So it had like the hang up line and dial tone detect and all of those lines were all wired in. So if you powered off the terminal, the server baseband detected that and powered the server off too. So I turned off this terminal because I felt bad for it being screen burned in and it shut down the server. There were only like five or six people logged into it. We powered it back up and checked the file systems and apologized. But like, that's amazing. <laughs> that terminal kind of got story. me started where yeah. I am today. Empathy for the terminal. Yeah. A good computer, fat pad. Yes. Well, beautiful. Thank you so much, Tabitha. This is wonderful. Thank uh, you everyone. Thank you so it's so great to us. see you. I'll be hanging around in the chat. All right, take care.